All right, welcome to Split Your Head. I am your host, Bob, and today I have a special guest on, Fred Barrett. He is an excellent writer I connected with over Letterboxd. Uh, He's written for uh, a bunch of publications on both music and film. Uh, These are Slant, In Review Online, Cinecentric, and The Big Ship, where he recently wrote a fascinating article on the pink film, and specifically uh, the director, Hisiasu Sato, who we're actually going to be talking about today. Uh, And he also has a substack. So I'll be uh, linking that in the show notes if you want to get some uh, special articles written by him. So yeah, today we have Fred. Say hello, Fred. Hey, what's up? (laughs) Uh, So yeah, let's start right off and just describe the pink film because it's uh, it's a genre that's specific to Japan and is kind of hard to wrap your head around. So I don't know if, Fred, you can explain it better for people who might have like no idea what it is. (laughs) Well, essentially... Pink films are kind of like um, they're kind of like soft softcore porn, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, they there's a really they vary a lot in content, but they do all kind of contain like sexual you know plots, like sexual scenes and stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's really only the only thing that's that connects them really. It's like a, a wide array of things that can be going on there. You know, some of them are really transgressive, some are romantic, some are kind of like sadomasochistic some you know it's, it's, right, it's right. all all kinds of stuff but yeah it is it is essentially softcore pornography and the idea was basically to to get audiences back into theaters in the 60s you know because um attendances have been going down and they figured we need to <laughs> kind of give people some some good stuff you know <laughs> so yeah. they won't get on tv so that's, i've heard that was this the thing idea. sex sells <laughs> Yeah, which apparently, which apparently isn't isn't even that true, but you know that's that's a whole other episode. That's a whole other episode, though. I feel like. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more complicated. That's that's what it is. For sure. Apparently, apparently. I don't know. Yeah, and it's interesting because with Japan and like, I mean, maybe I'm I'm kind of jumping the gun here, but Japan they have that whole rule with sex that they censored the genitalia. Yes, yes, that is. A, yeah, that is a and so I, it seems like the pink films uh, became like a very strange strain <laughs> of softcore, maybe because of that. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. like that um, urged directors to go off into like really bizarre directions because <laughs> yeah. they were restrained in other areas, right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's definitely part of it. Yeah, I'd say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it, it's also kind of just. Um, I think it's also a good part of it is just like economic necessity. Like you want to get your foot in the door uh, in the right. industry. So you kind of go to these low budget, like, you know, movies that you can just like kind of, you can just bang them out essentially, or literally sometimes, you know, you can, you can just like <laughs> kind of put them out there and you'd have your name on like a bunch of movies that will play in theaters. And, you yeah. Know, and I think like, I was, I was reading that how, um, that one of the spe- specifications of it was that they had to be produced within a week. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think that, or that's the myth, at least. I don't know. It's probably some truth yeah. to it, though. Yeah. That's but what I've heard, too. That's what I've read. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in, in research for your article, I'm guessing you watched a bunch of them from like the <laughs> 60s and 70s, right? Yeah, yeah. Too many, you could say. Yeah. <laughs> too many. <laughs> I think, I think that's sort of the, the consensus on pink films is that it's so easy to kind of fall into a rabbit hole with them. Yeah. yeah. Um, which speaks to, I think the like accessible, I don't want to say accessible. They're definitely not accessible. No. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah. uh, but like I was watching one last night that has like, I think the worst, one of the worst titles ever. Like I, <laughs> I don't even want to say it. Uh, and uh, it was, I think from 1977. Mm-hmm. And I remember just thinking like, Okay, this looks like uh, a big budget exploitation film. It's fairly <laughs> right, right. slick, and it, yeah. and it's shot well. The actors yeah. are good. The, the effects yeah. look great. It's got great editing. It's paced really well. Yeah. It just like you tell someone the storyline, and they'd be <laughs> like, "How did people see this?" It's yeah, like, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, th- there was kind of a change. I mean, I guess the roots of the genre are kind of low budget, but they were successful at the time, like in the Mm -hmm. 60s and 70s, they were actually successful, or there were successful ones, at least. And I think there was kind of a shift in the 80s when, you know, um, 
like adult home video stuff started coming out so people wouldn't have to go to the theater anymore to, to mm. get that kind of titillating stuff uh really yeah so um what happened was the budgets got smaller and it kind of you know and the, the genre kind of got this like this kind of lo-fi sleazy kind of thing right. that's like you know that's that sado yeah. does really well Right, right. So that's who we we mainly want to focus on because right. um, he's. He, uh, I mean, there are a lot of notable pink film directors, yeah. but I think I think he's almost become the most uh, well known. I don't know if you'd agree. Yeah, I mean, but, you can you can definitely make that case. Yeah, yeah, because like the only other person I can think of that is maybe along the same lines would be like. Koji Wakamatsu. Mm. Yeah. Are you familiar I mean, at all with him? Or I'm trying to think. Actually, yeah. He uh, Ecstasy of the Angels, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he's he kind of inhabits like a similar space. I would say he kind of gets like he he almost gets like kind of auteur credibility. Yeah. In that you know, it's not like people don't really see him as like like quote unquote a mere pink film director right because there is a lot of like political stuff in his movies plus he's also made like like non-pinku films as well i think united red army was yeah like a, it was like a big one a long have one you, have you seen that yes i have seen it but it was, it was actually a while ago and it was very kind of you know i don't think i had i could really contextualize it correctly because i was like this is so mm -hmm. bleak like this is so you know yeah. it's like really i don't know like the vibe yeah. the vibes are just really like off mm. <laughs> i've i've been reading a bunch the past year like um i showed fred this book before we started recording but uh i read this earlier behind the pink curtain by jasper sharp and then i read another book i it's i'm not gonna go grab it but it's uh <laughs> it's a book on japanese new wave cinema and it was interesting kind of tracing the lines of some of the more like avant-garde and some of the more transgressive um, Japanese cinema to these political um, like moments that were coming up. And I, I found a lot of it really hard to wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. um, but it was one of those things where it was the existence of the context Mm -hmm. Not maybe not knowing exactly what the context was, but the existence mm -hmm. that there is a context that it right. isn't just someone who's just like, I want to see some crazy shit, you know? Yeah, like, right, right, they're right. just like they're they're like they're putting really transgressive um, content out, mm -hmm. but it's coming from a place that um, for them is like rooted in a lot of like, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like political turmoil, basically. You know? Yeah, 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 and you're trying, to, a you're lot trying of... to capture something about like you know that's like almost like beyond words. It's kind of a you know it's it's hard. I think it's hard sometimes to summarize like really a feeling you get in a certain moment of time or a mm -hmm. certain moment in time, I should say. Yeah, uh, and I think I think this, these transgressive things they can kind of help kind of put that feeling on the audience, right? Mm -hmm. So you're sitting there and you're like, man, this is so grim. But it's like that's that's what was going on, you know. So you kind of you kind of put that on people, but you, because yeah. you can't really say you can't really just have characters sitting there and be like, "Man, we are all," you know, "Man, things are really bad right now," you know. That's right, not that's right. not effective filmmaking. Like you need to kind of yeah, you don't need to, but it's like you know, in certain situations, you want to kind of put that feeling on the audience too, and kind of make them feel what what's going on in the narrative or like going on mm -hmm. in that world. That's you know. Yeah, because um, to me, it's it's like what you're talking about, Fred, is like very um, would be like very didactic in a way of like mm -hmm. of like pr if if it's expositional mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in the way it's presenting the problems that they're dealing with, then it becomes sort of like we're trying to teach you about right. our issues, you know, right, right. Um, but instead you're feeling them, you know, mm -hmm. and I yeah. can see how that's sort of it's like a. That, to me that's like more cathartic and that's um yeah that's something that i think what really makes me gravitate towards at least like sado stuff you know yeah, yeah. He, there's definitely something cathartic about uh, cathartic about it so yeah, <laughs> yeah no I, I i definitely agree and actually i was having this conversation recently i um 
I was talking about this, uh, the, the book American Psycho. Oh, and yeah, I th- yeah. And I think, I think um, you know, people have their own feelings about it and for obvious, for good reason, you know, to, to yeah. be honest. And mm-hmm. but, um, but I think what the book does really well is it kind of pulls you into this, like, nihilistic vortex that, like, you know, the, the characters are in. Yeah. Because, like, you're reading it and you're, like, at first you think, oh, this is actually really funny because he's, all, you know, listing all these brand names and whatever and nothing's really yeah. going on. And then kind of keeps going. You're like, man, this is like boring as hell, you know? And then kind of keeps going. <laughs> and it's like, this is so grim. And then, it, yeah. and then you're bored again. But then, you know, by the end of it, you're just like, you're in this like weird in between place where you don't even really know like <laughs> yeah. what you're feeling. You know, I think for, for me personally, those, those things can be very valuable, but I do understand that it like repels people sometimes. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. And I think that's sort of like a byproduct of of trying to make something that is uh, like authentic mm-hmm. in a way, authentically yeah. um, like representing despair. I guess yeah. that would be the best way. Because I okay, like, and and maybe we're getting too far off the the Japanese <laughs> uh, content here, but yeah. I could have sworn a long time ago I came across some sort of interview or clip of like Brett Easton Ellis saying that the book was, um, was about him like expressing depression. And when yeah, I viewed it extent, from, yeah. through that, le- when I viewed it through that lens, it made a lot more sense to me because mm-hmm. I started to look at the destruction of, of, you know, the victims of the women uh, and yeah. how detailed they get as almost like destruction of the self. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah. and maybe that is a good way to view at least like I feel like you could view Sato's work like that, you know, um, because mm-hmm. he does have um, uh, like a context to it. Like it, they don't just feel completely one sided, you know, it's like yeah, all the I mean, care, all, all the yeah. characters are, are um, participating. Yeah. Are it gets usually into, are participating. Yeah. It, it gets into some thorny kind of stuff with, with regards to like, you know, autonomy and like consent and like, you know, um, I don't know, like abuse and like participation in that abuse. I mean, there is some yeah, pretty, yeah thorny stuff in there. But uh, yeah, and I, do, I do agree, though, with, with, with uh, mm. what you're saying. Yeah. Well, that's, um, I feel like that's a good jumping off point because, um, you know, that's something that comes up in a lot of his work. So like in the bedroom, that's, uh, that's a film about uh, a club where, um, is it just women or is it people in general? They go to the the sex rooms and they take the halcyon and they put themselves to sleep so people can like have their way with them. Yeah, if, um, if I remember correctly, it's just the women take this uh, take this drug and then men, like a male clientele, comes and and has their way with them. Yeah, or like so has some it's, kind it's, of way with them. You know, it's not necessarily only like you know penetration or whatever it's also i think a lot of it is is kind of that dynamic like she's unconscious and i can kind of do with her whatever i want like it's a it's like a power fantasy too it's not necessarily just like i want to have sex with this unconscious woman it's also a lot of it is kind of in the movie you see a lot of touching going on and like a lot of you know a lot of that kind of thing i think just the Mm -hmm. idea like even gets them off Somehow. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. So it's sort of like, um, it's not so much the act of sex, mm-hmm. uh, so much as the engaging of the idea of the right, idea exactly. of like the, the power dynamic. Exactly. Cause way. I feel like if it was just yeah. about sex, he would have just given us like sex scenes. Cause obviously that would have been part of like the thing, but it, it, I, don't, I don't think he ever shows like actual sex in those, in that like room, in that club, in that sex club. Yeah, I don't really remember that either. It's yeah. more just, um, as you said, like like um, these men going in there and just enjoying the fact that there is this woman who's right. like completely powerless. Right. Um, and it's interesting because it's like, uh, in terms of the narrative, they are consenting to taking the halcyon. They right, are consenting right. to the, but it's like consenting to entering into a situation where it's like empty impossible to consent to right right exactly do you do yeah. know what i mean because they have no yeah, exactly what you mean yeah. they're, they're just yeah 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 i mean that's um, also that's part of the plot too i mean you know the the main character i forget her name but um she she actually stops taking 
the drug because she says like oh, I do actually yeah, want yeah. to know what's going on in there. Mm-hmm. But like she has, still has her eyes closed, or, or for the longest time she she has her eyes closed, and she's like, I you know I, I can't even open them because like I was I'm actually scared of what I'm going to see, <laughs> you know. Wow. And she says she's <laughs> going to see hell in there. I think that's the word she uses, or the, you know, the yeah. Word she uses. And then you mentioned that in your article because um, is it uh, I don't know if it was the is is a Sagawa. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So okay. Here the, we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the. Yeah. 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 You know, he's he has a cameo in. A, right. I mean, should we explain who he is? Maybe. Well. Uh, yeah. But then I want to get back to the the thing because the yeah. But you do you want to explain his? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, no. I can explain. I mean, um, Issei Sagawa is uh, is a Japanese man. He he recently died. Actually, I think. This year or last year, um, but he's, I'm okay with that. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm okay, I didn't, I'm okay yeah, with that. I wasn't, I wasn't too bummed. Yeah, weirdly, I wasn't no. too bummed. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, he's um, he's a Japanese man. He's uh, he was famous or infamous, I should say, for um, he was an exchange student in in France, and he murdered one of his um, uh, a fellow student, and. Uh, he murdered her, and I think he actually um, had sex with the corpse, if I remember correctly. And then he ate like parts of her, like he dismembered her and ate parts of her and stuff. And like mm. what made what made this case so famous? I mean, aside from like the you know obviously the sensational nature of the crime, yeah. is um, <laughs> there was some legal like you know shenanigans going on that led to him going free back in Japan because he was incarcerated in in France. And the mm-hmm. French got angry because they were like, "We don't want to pay for this guy to be here." And then they, oh. and then they sent him to Japan. They, um, is the word extradited him to Japan? Okay. I think and, so. Um, and then um, somehow that led to him just like not being, you know, not facing a trial or anything. So he was just a free man. Yeah. In Japan. Yeah, um, so, I I think there. I was reading about it like. Uh, it also had somewhat to do with his father, who is a like a really wealthy, powerful man. Yeah, he was like influential, sort of... but yeah, I've actually mm. never been able to really put my like really get a grasp on how big of a role he played, or you know, if there was like some yeah. element of corruption going <clears throat> on. It's surprisingly yeah, well, it is, kind of it is clearly corrupt that that happened. I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, but yeah. I meant like corruption in like the old school kind of greasing palms right. kind of way, you know, like <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I actually. It probably didn't hurt, though. Probably didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. Well, I mean, to have a father who's influential. I mean. Oh right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> that probably didn't hurt. <laughs> he he must have paid off somebody along the lines. I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, something wasn't working the way it was. The way it's no, supposed no. To, for sure. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, from what I understand, he never committed another crime. Um, yeah. But then no, he went on to have like a pretty big career as like a celebrity yeah i think i think actually honestly i think his celebrity status is like a little bit overstated okay because like the, yeah from from what i gather it's like you know people say oh he was on tv shows and he was in movies and he wrote like but this is all like very obscure kind of stuff like right, i think the bedroom yeah. is probably i think the bedroom which is a movie that basically nobody knows <laughs> it's that from like weirdos yeah. and what you know it's like and people listening like now <laughs> right exactly exactly <laughs> it's like i think um i think that's like the height of of like what you know the stuff he did like it, it didn't get more really more mainstream than that from what i gather right that's true yeah 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 did you ever see that documentary on him i think it's called Canaba. oh the oh like the, the legit not the vice documentary the the real, like, no, I haven't no, seen that. No, no, there was. Oh my god, yeah. it is terrifying. Yeah, I, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> the, literally, the I'd say maybe seventy five percent of the film is mm-hmm. is like close ups, like him, like this, and he's oh. just like, then I, uh, <laughs> then I ate her butt. You know, he's just going on. <laughs> it's so up you're close. Actually, it's yeah. terrifying. You're actually doing the impression. <laughs> <laughs> well it's all a subtitle i'm not gonna do yeah, like, yeah no no accent, of course but, of course of course <laughs> yeah it's and it's interesting because 
and I can see why Sado would want to use him then, yeah. um, because he did this one horrible act that he should mm-hmm. have been incarcerated for, yeah. and then he's had this um, life that's built off of that one act, yeah. and so his life is built around this um, constant like lack, I guess I could say, and this constant mm-hmm. desire that's feeding off of like the most um, uh, immoral thing. You know, it's like. <laughs> It does sound like a character out of a Sado film. Right. I mean, it is It is also kind of, there is a weirdness to it because it's like, even if he wanted to leave it behind, he just like couldn't because that's mm-hmm. the only thing he could do with his life. Like he did that thing and that's like, it doesn't just define him like as a person. It also defines it like everything he does because it's like, he's not going to get a, mm-hmm. he's not going to work in a supermarket, you know, like people <laughs> just no. not going to hire him. So he's, he's like, essentially yeah. the system like forces him to kind of embrace this part of, you know, of who he is. Yeah. You know, which is just like a super That's weird situation to, to put someone in. I mean that, you know, it sounds like he's a victim here. Like, I can't believe they did this. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, <but> like, <laughs> no, you know what I mean? I didn't though, even, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I didn't even think about it like that because yeah. I thought it more of more in terms of that um, because he wasn't punished by the system, like he wasn't imprisoned mm-hmm. or anything, mm-hmm. um, that in a sense, it was sort of like this existential punishment of like, well, then your <laughs> life is just going to be defined by that. And no right, matter right, what, like right. your identity equals you, what you did in France right. in like 1982 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Wrong, but yeah. Yeah. yeah some, sometime then, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is so, a, that is actually an interesting thing, an existential punishment. Like that's <laughs> that should be a movie. That should be a movie. Yeah, or a novel even. Yeah. yeah. It, it is uh it is Kafka esque in a oh yeah. no, you know it I think it's more Dostoevsky in person. More Dostoevsky, yeah. 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 I mean the legal kind of, shenanigans are kind of Kafka esque maybe. <laughs> like what was you yes, know, it's like that a bit way. of both, yeah. Yeah, it's like yeah. both. Because it, it makes me think, and I, you know, I never, I don't think I ever fully read this book. I think I read like a comic version at one point, but Crime and Punishment, the mm-hmm, Dostoevsky right. book. Yeah. Yeah. Which was like a guy murders this woman and then he does, he gets away with it and then he just like mm. goes crazy. Yeah. Um, because he's just like, I can't believe I did that. Um, yeah, these yeah. Russian novels. Maybe that's a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's fair to say that Sado probably read some Japanese translations of these books. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he de- yeah, he's de- he's definitely been reading some weird stuff, I'd say, yeah, or some mm. challenging, like out there, kind of existential stuff. Definitely, I mean, right, it, it, right. I think it bleeds through. I mean, we'll probably get into this later too, because like he yeah. does have kind of a literary <clears throat> influence that you can kind of easily kind of detect. I think, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I wanted to get into, uh, because you mentioned the woman in the bedroom. Uh, she wanted to not take the halcyon because she wanted to see um, what was going on. She was scared. Like th- she thought she'd see hell. You right. mentioned this in your article about um, how Issa Sagawa was wearing goggles and how right. um, for him, it was almost like, uh, like he was wearing goggles. Uh, was it to prevent him from seeing hell or because it was masking that his eyes were the window to hell? Well, I, um... Um, <laughs> I have to be honest, I don't remember exactly what I was thinking here, but, um, oh, okay. <laughs> I think the way I see it, like if you, you asking me now, I'd say, um, yeah. I think it was interesting because like, um, one of the things that that's going on in that movie in the bedroom is, um, a lot of it is about like people seeing each other and like, you know, gazes. So, you know, you have a lot of perspective mm. from like handheld cameras and like Sato's camera and, you know, all these things. And, like, sometimes characters will look directly into the camera, but not, like, breaking the fourth wall, but he's, he'll just have, like, the camera in the refrigerator. And, like, the character will open it and right. kind of look into it, and it'll be like they're looking right at you. But um, Sagawa mm-hmm. is actually the only character to actually look at the camera, like, at Sato's camera, like, actually. But his oh, eyes are okay. obscured by these dark glasses, so it's kind of like, you know it's it's kind of an interesting thing because the the connection i make is kind of this um mm. this the sex club it's like a i describe it as like a non place because it's like you know it's just like basically oh, it's, okay. it's just like a void right and so right. so the people in there they're like you know like non humans you know like you know um quote unquote non would you say it's like a virtual reality 
No, no. I think it's more. I think it's more. Um, I think it's more like almost like a Twilight world. You know, almost. I mean, okay. I think in the in the logic of the film, it definitely is like an actual place. But like for us as an audience, okay. I don't think we're he's necessarily taking us like, oh, we're in a room now where this happens. It's more like I think he's kind of. It's more like a sensory kind of thing where you're kind of like, mm. you know, he takes you into this void. It's just like this dark void because the way he designs the set is like, it's just like all black and then like a flickery background, like a screen that like flickers, like a huge screen. And then mm-hmm. these people like, you know, with like this red lighting on them. So it's kind of, it does kind of have like an infernal quality to it, I think. So that's, mm. you know, in a metaphorical sense, it's like a non-place. And I think Sagawa being in that place and like looking at the camera as like the only character yeah. to actually look at the camera, um, hi- having his eyes obscured, it is kind of like he's saying, you know, he's almost like maybe characterizing him as, as a kind of demon maybe or, you know, some kind of like non-human okay. entity. So maybe then he's almost like the extreme end of this non-place like if you go into the non-place if you um like depersonalize yourself Mm -hmm. you go to the furthest end of the Mm -hmm. extreme Mm -hmm. and you'll and you'll reach someone like Issa Sagawa who is (laughs) is probably the one person that um I mean it's it's fair to say because he never really was an actor prior to it that he's the one connection that people will have to the real world that we live in so he's right. almost of a place that he's almost of the most <laughs> so com- I'm not going to say non non place yeah, but yeah. of a uh, <laughs> place because he's yeah. from like our reality right. and he's it uh, from our reality in this non place which is a fictional world looking yeah. at us do you know yeah. what I mean I know it's I know what you mean and I actually love that but... I I I love that thought though <laughs> a, yeah no I, oh, cool, I see what cool. you, I, see, I see the vision I see the vision definitely yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, mean, I was kind of. Yeah. You go ahead. Go oh, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, I I, I grabbed this quote um, from the uh, beyond, behind the pink curtain book because I was just try, trying to grab some quotes that Sato said because he he said some really profound things, mm-hmm. um, and this was taken from Asian Cult Cinema Magazine. So uh, basically, Japanese critics often applied this term to his work, which was discommunication, and so mm-hmm. um, in in regards to that, he said. There is a problem of communication among people. We don't know how to do it anymore, and this causes us pain. And then the book went on to talk about this phenomenon in Japan called, um, I'm, kind of like, I'm going to probably botch this, but uh, hikiko mori, which is um, when people retreat from the physical world, yeah. and they basically, it's like teenagers do this a lot. And I think this yeah. is a really common phenomenon of like uh, younger generations coming up, but like retreating from the physical world going inside of your room and creating a virtual world, right? right and so right. when you're talking about this, um, I mentioned that like, oh, is is the the sex club almost, you know, as a non-place, is it like a virtual world, you know? But, oh, okay. I mean, that's yeah. a stretch, but do, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I do know what you mean, yeah, yeah. I can see it, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, because like if she's going into this non-place that she goes, so she goes into this non-place, um, but almost, uh, you know, participating as someone who is not participating, who's just like, I'm turning my mind off, you know? Mm-hmm. And she's like, yeah. no, I want to turn my mind on. And it's yeah. someone from our reality who is right. like a cannibal. You know? Right, right. Like, like an actual. That's crazy. <laughs> that like is literally crazy. a cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, oh. uh, yeah, it's, it's a doozy, but. This is the thing about his films. They're like, if you really take the time to pick them apart, there's so much going on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I mean, I think, (laughs) I think he, I think what he does is, um, he kind of, um, he kind of always, almost makes these like certain, certain feelings. And like, you know, you mentioned earlier, like despair, these things, he kind of makes them like tangible, you know, like he, other people would maybe have like a scene of somebody like breaking down and crying or like being depressed or like, you know, and he literally just like takes characters and puts them like in a place that's like, you know, hellish and dark. And, you know, so it's, Mm -hmm. I mean, I I don't know exactly what that place is, 
you know, it's despair, it's alienation, it's all these different things. I mean, it's desire too. I mean, at the end of the day, like the bedroom is like a sex club, you know? So it is kind of not right, just right. like despair. It is, it is also kind of just like lust and like, you know, like, uh, just like yeah. radioactive amounts of horniness. Like, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's, like, it's like, yeah. But it's also, uh, it's also, there's, I think when whenever we say ambiguous, it's almost like putting like a clean word on a mess, you know. But I think <laughs> in this case mm. with with Sado, the ambiguity is almost um, the indecision. You know, it's like it can be all these things mm. uh, and none of these things. You know, and it's yeah. it, it exists as because that's like the non entity is something that is it exists. But right. it's um, it doesn't have like a solidified state, you know. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like this is on some real Kierkegaard level shit. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I did not expect to get so existential with this. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. It didn't you even know? take that long? I feel like. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I was like, so there's cannibalism, and then existential. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. I mean, his films do kind of, you know, I was I was talking. I was talking about his movies um, with someone and, and she said like, uh, you know, it's kind of weird because you, you can't really figure out with um, what like the character motivations are really even sometimes. It's no, like, why yeah. would somebody do that? Why would, you know, why would you put yourself in that situation? You know, why would somebody, you know, like, you know, there's uh, this movie brain sex also a Sado film. And like, she I just watched that last night. Yeah. And I mean, and she's like, you know, this, uh, this pirate DJ, he tries to assault her and you would think, Oh, that's the end of it. Like, you know, she's gone. Like she's yeah. out of there. But like, then she actually yeah. goes back and like they talk and then they work together. And then, but then by the end, she like actually kills him. And it's like, you know, like what is <laughs> sometimes it's like, Spoiler you alert. Even... <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if you can meaningfully <laughs> spoil these movies to no, be honest. You can't. Like, but uh, it's yeah. almost better to spoil as like a heads up, like ooh, that <laughs> right. happens. Like, yeah, oh, that happens, you know. Yeah, but you know, it's kind of it's kind of weird. It, it is kind of it is kind of um, it it is just kind of this. I mean, this ambiguity is just like it's so baked in. It's like just like from the ground up. It's just ambiguous. Like you know, people yeah. love to people love to call, say that now. Like oh, the movie was all a dream or something. But, you know, his movies do actually have that quality to them. But totally. they're, hard to, yeah. they're hard to follow sometimes, too, because, like, I, I, I swear to God, I watched, like, Celluloid Nightmares today. Oh, and it's still, like, okay. or rewatched it, I should say. Um, yeah. And, like, I still can't, like, exactly wrap my head around, like, what's going yeah. on. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's just, like, um, orders on incoherent, even. Right, right. I I saw so I watched Naked Blood. That was the first one I saw of his mm -hmm. years ago, like probably mm -hmm. ten years ago. And yeah. then um, I think two or three years ago, I watched um, Celluloid Nightmares, mm -hmm. and I couldn't get into it at all. I to right. me, um, like I I know this sounds kind of like a weird metaphor, but I feel like with his films, you need to watch a few of them to kind of like get the decoder ring you know to kind of yeah. crack into <laughs> yeah, like yeah, what yeah. you're watching and yeah. celluloid nightmares is just a little too sleazy for me to really engage with initially mm. right initially I mean, yeah yeah there's yeah like there's there's like uh the incest that happens which is i'm already like oh okay yeah. <laughs> uh, also too yeah. that's when you start to see the um or I should say, hear the uh, mm -hmm. the slurping sounds like he's this, this, every uh, this, time he gets it, people to make out. It's crazy. This ASMR inducing kind of sound design, like the worst example, or like the worst, like just the most intense example I can think of is probably Muscle. Is, is uh, yeah, yeah. They, they get they go to some really crazy wet sounding <laughs> places, like when he okay. actually puts like the. <laughs> He puts like mayonnaise or like some cream cheese or something on the other guy's body, and I'm just like, oh, this is gonna, this is gonna be an intense like, <laughs> this is gonna be an intense uh, sound yeah, experience yeah. right here. <laughs> I but it's it's weird because like muscle to me is is like the perfect one to start with, and I think that yes, there's a really yes. um, there's a really tangible like 
like sense of like longing mm-hmm. to it. There's a really like it's a very haunting film. And yeah. it it seems to be like it's a it is abstract, but it's I don't know. It doesn't feel as like confusing as yeah. Movies. No, it is as as far as like his films go, it's pretty straightforward. Like I think it's mm-hmm. like a very easy kind of you know A to B to C kind of causal thing going on. I think that's probably. I was actually telling somebody this on Twitter, I think yesterday or today even, like, you know, it's probably the best place to start, yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, Naked Blood is an easy one to mention, but yeah. because it has, like, the least amount of sex, it's more of, right. like, a straight-up horror film. Yeah. But even like then, I found, thing. um, yeah, like, it feels like uh, you're watching, like, a splattery Cronenberg mm-hmm. film or something. Yeah. Um, but I found... It is in the like, title in it, Splatter. <laughs> Oh Splatter, yeah, Splatter, <laughs> Naked Blood. Some titles um, use that. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, he has a whole like double title thing too, right? So yeah, yeah. It's like every every film comes out. It's like either um like you know like swallowing the the ancient winds yeah. or like <laughs> woman on a train being molested or something. Yeah, like, right. it's just, <laughs> Absurd, I should be laughing yeah. at this, yeah. <laughs> but it yeah, is true. You know, I, I, I have a tendency to laugh when I'm un- uncomfortable by something. Yeah. So, like, I think I said this on one of our other episodes, how uh, it just gets to the point where, like, certain films will be so extreme or disturbing that yeah. I just start laughing. I'm like, what? Yeah. You know I mean, what it mean? does so kind of tip over like, at some point, yeah. Yeah, I think... Um, I'm trying to think, like, what would have initiated that his some of his films are pretty harsh but i also after seeing like quite like a few other pinkus by Mm -hmm. other directors i think he stays on the cusp of like the most depraved stuff yeah but i've seen way worse do you know what i mean like i think other directors have have like plunged further in those depths yeah i think i think he's I think he's very much committed to like, um, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, a movie doesn't have to say something to be worthwhile. That's what I'm trying to, to get at. But I yeah. think, I think he is very committed to like the ideas he has about like the world and like filmmaking that he, he doesn't yeah. really sacrifice them just to get something made or it doesn't, it doesn't seem like he would do that. Although I, I do have to say, I, I've, I haven't seen all of his movies and probably there's some yeah, stickers in there. You know, you can't always hit that, you know, that moving target. Like, it's just it's, uh, it's extremely difficult. He made, he made like, 70 films, I think? Yeah, I, I don't even know. Yeah. But yeah, sounds about right, honestly. Well, that's um, that's the, the number I got from Jasper Sharp's book, which came out, like, a few years ago. So, I mean, he could have added a couple on there. But I think he mm. uh, stopped making them, at least regularly, I yeah, yeah, it's like kind of his, it, yeah. His output has kind of diminished considerably. I think his last movie was 2019, I think, but I haven't actually oh, seen it. That's still pretty recent. Yeah, but you know, like a lot of hmm. big gaps in between though. These days. Right, right. Yeah. Like not as prolific as like yeah. Like I'm sure he must have been churning out like three or four a year, it's, or maybe yeah, more. I mean, yeah, yeah. If I mean, seventy. Yeah, I mean that, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but. Uh, the the films that you're talking about that mm-hmm. he did that might have you know skewered towards like just pure spectacle I guess like no meaning or anything mm-hmm. I feel like are maybe the ones that I I don't really have an interest in watching yeah as they are the ones that contain animals <laughs> yeah like horror yeah I mean I don't yeah <laughs> no we don't have you, have I mean, you know I, I don't know I've, do you I, know I that had... sorry go ahead yeah. Oh no! Do you know the podcast? Um, show me something wrong. No, no, I'm actually not a big podcast oh. person. Oh, okay. Well, well maybe split your head is different, that. though. I mean, you know, can't deny oh, quality. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we have an endorsement. Um, but yeah, no. Show me something wrong is cool. It's uh, it's two directors, uh, Guy Fragments and Dave Jackson. And basically every episode they um, cover like a different film that they consider like wrong. And so sometimes mm-hmm. that means um, it could mean a lot of things, but often it does mean like really disturbing or mm-hmm. like messed up films. And so they've mm-hmm. covered, 
at least one Sado, and I'm pretty sure it was, um, I think it's called Wave, but also is known as, um, probably the title has like horse in it. Oh, yeah. I, I I'll know just the say one. that much. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And so they talked about how um, they actually liked it quite a bit. <laughs> and uh and okay so the the big thing is like we were we were mentioning this at the beginning of the episode how in japan um they censor genitalia right and so you could actually stage a lot of wild stuff <laughs> by doing that because you don't actually have to yeah. go all the way like i mean right, as right. you mentioned these are these are like softcore films so there isn't really like penetration going on right. um so you could uh fake thank God, <laughs> a lot of stuff. Uh, right. And so I think that's, that's probably how he's managed to make at least two, if not more films yeah. in, involving animals. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, the movie you mentioned or the one that you mentioned of the podcast, I think at one point, this is what mm-hmm. I've heard. I think at one point, like the entire screen is just blurred. <laughs> and, and that's what I've heard. I'm pretty yeah. sure I read that somewhere. Right. That like, just you know, it got it, you know, it's, it's got so bad. Like, just the entire screen is just blurred. But the thing is, like, you know, but, it's not. Yeah, he, he, it could be anything. But they behind know that, that. Blur. right? And and I think the like the directors know that fully. Yeah. yeah. Because like, yeah. if you if you read into like the history of pink films, they'll they'll talk about how the directors go into every production knowing that. So oftentimes you get really like well staged scenes where it's like, mm. oh, there's a table like conveniently placed, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or in some cases, um, there's one that I watched called uh, Woods Are Wet, where mm-hmm. they actually use squares that pop up over it. But then I was reading about it afterwards, how like that was a co- supposed to be kind of a comment on the censorship of like, it's right. so garish that it's like literally squares. Right. So because to me, usually I it's like fogging it's, going on, right? Usually they will like have this yeah. fog effect that's like uh, that's supposed to blur or obscure like genitals or whatever. Right, which mm. is to me is like almost just such a Sado esque concept yeah. to begin right. with. You know, <laughs> it's like the the um, the wall between. Like I was writing this down in my notes, and it's something I I feel is like a theme that pops up a lot in his films is like this idea of like a wall between the things that we're connecting with, but the mm-hmm. wall itself connects us to those things. Mm-hmm. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I know that's such a like uh, heady concept, but but yeah, like, I mean, maybe I mean, elaborate voyeurism. on that because it's it sounds kind of yeah, no. It's it. I mean, voyeurism in a way is is kind of like that of like how with voyeurism you are you're like now connecting to the person that you're watching in on but because Mm -hmm. you're the voyeur and you're watching that you are distanced from it and i think that um in his films he has like different iterations of that you know of like for sure of like technology as like um was it in uh okay so i watched two of his films last night um kiri ellison ellison do you Uh, know that one i'm not sure Maybe I know it by a different um, title or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, like Woman Hell, something. I, don't, I have no idea. Uh, yeah. But it's it's about uh, it's about a woman who gets into like wiretapping. Mm. And no, her I, boyfriend no, or her lover's in the hospital and he has like goggles on. And so there's all these <laughs> scenes where um, phones keep interrupting. Like at one scene, one scene it interrupts like an assault and ends mm-hmm. the assault because like the phone's ringing oh. and another scene, the phone is ringing while two people are having sex and right. the woman like takes it off the hook and then has to like hang up like during sex. Oh. And I, I thought that was like, so like, wow. Like that's, that's Sado, right? That there. is. Like, yeah. Yeah. Technology but- as a communication tool that's dividing or interrupting. You know? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, also, and, and I think it also plays into this thing because, like, the um, you know, like especially for a voyeur, like y- you want that distance, like you know, you crave yeah. it, like and what it, it separates us, but it's also you want that, like that's that's the thing that like gets you off in that moment, and like a lot of his movies are like so much of it is about like you know peeping toms. You know, yeah. somebody's like looking in on something like even uh, like brain sex. She watches her parents have like 
like you know masochistic like sex yeah, phase. yeah. <laughs> and, and like she watches and like the camera like peers through the, the crack in the door and all these things you know but it's like she's like repelled but she's also kind of like it also kind of keeps her there so, you know this mm. thing separating her that's what makes it titillating because like yeah. maybe she just like if she just like saw it and it was just like no big deal it wouldn't you know it would be like a totally different thing right yeah oh man i i wish i i wish i knew where this was but um do you know the director nagisa oshima yeah, yeah. i think that's his name he did yeah. like in the realm of senses and stuff yes. um he talked to he talked about it like i have one of his books of essays the idea that like with with like the censorship in Japan and pornography, there's always this sense of like, but we can see more. Like we're behind this wall in a way, you know. Yeah. And it's it's almost like um, I think that he's kind of playing this idea that if you go, if you're actually shown everything, that like it it destroys the desire or it, it like destroys something, you know. And um, I don't know. I I guess what I'm trying to get at with yeah. that is like. Yeah is again, like this idea of like a wall that connects you to something, um, but what also keeps you distant from something, you know? And I think like yeah. voyeurism, as you said, is something that ex exists like that, where it's it's like you, you are defined by the distance and you're also defined by the engagement, you know? Yeah, yeah. It is like an inherently paradoxical thing. Like it is, it does have kind of, that same ambiguity yeah. that we were talking about like it's just it's just in there like you know it's it's all it's almost like a, a, a dog chasing a car like you know like there's no real end a dog point chasing to a it car? like the ch yeah i mean you know there's no real the dog doesn't actually know what to do once it you know once the car stops like you're just chasing it you know right, that's yeah. like the thing that you know that's the thing that kind of that makes it interesting like the chase is what's interesting about it like somebody who's like a voyeur wouldn't necessarily mm. be turned on to be like in a room with this person that they're spying on not necessarily right you know, they want that distance that's what they actually want yeah and i mean to go back to what i was saying earlier about um was it the hikako mori the phenomenon yeah. in japan of yeah. like a people isolating themselves yeah. you know it's it's this idea of of like um, co like they're communicating with the world from always from behind like a wall in a way or always mm -hmm. with this d distance you know yeah. but uh, it ends up defining them even though it's not actually like something tangible yeah yeah I mean you know? um, I saw this interview that Sato did um, I think it was like a panel or something um, and he talks about he talks about um I forget what the exact term is, but it was basically being scared of eye contact. He said that's a very common thing. In, oh, yeah. He, he said that's a very common thing in Japan, apparently, that people kind of avoid eye contact. And like he said that some people like eye contact feels like vi almost like violence to them. Like somebody's like harming you, like looking at you. And, um, right, and right. kind of that, that kind of goes into the way he makes the films because like mm. there's this uh I, I used the quote in the um in the article i wrote um that uh i think martin scorsese said this about peeping tom he said uh it's mm. an exploration of how the camera violates so you know you're basically being stared at by this thing and that's like another thing that always comes up in his movies again and again it's like you have these cameras looking at you or like these people's space being invaded by like you know someone with a camera and like celluloid nightmares actually does the peeping tom thing with like the knife in the camera you know oh, true yeah so that's wow, that's kind of interesting you know so like this you know you're kind of i mean not looking at some someone i mean in the western world it will be like you know i'm talking to you look you know look me in the eye you know you're talking to me yeah it's yeah. like offensive if yeah. you don't do it but um you know, yeah. in like in like the in the cinematic context, it can be like, you know, it can be like very invasive, very aggressive, very forceful, and like, you know, right. and it, probably even more so, you know, in this Japanese context, where apparently, you know, according to Sato, it's it's um, it's uh, it's less common. People are less comfortable, maybe, with that. So it becomes even mm. more like aggressive as a gesture, you know. 
Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's interesting because like like Isai Sagawa looks into the camera, right. and I'm pretty sure that happens a lot throughout Sato's other films. Is like mm-hmm. someone at one point like looking right into the camera. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I and when you put it in that context, it makes me realize like like I was I was reading about this in the behind the pink curtain, um, how a lot of his like scenes of violence and sex scenes are not really there to like titillate you. Mm-hmm. They're there to like overwhelm you to like right. force right. you to look at something. They, right. um, uh, Jasper Sharp made the connection between, um, Buñuel's, uh, and Shannon de Lou with, mm-hmm. uh, the ice, the, uh, uh, the eye being slid open yeah, is yeah. Of, of like how it's, it's like forcing you to look at something. Yeah. They also, he also connected it to a clockwork orange of like how Alex is, like forced to look at these images right, right? Right, right and so right. um you know and and so with sado he's kind of doing that in a way where it's like if you're a jet because these films are made for japanese audiences yeah. clearly yeah. like and so having someone just like look at the camera then yeah. becomes like yet another provocation in a way like yeah. another act of violence as you yeah. said like someone looking at the looking at you in your eyes which is which is odd though because i think you know with this films being you know, I, as we've discussed, like, I think they are like statements on communication and mm-hmm. how like in, a, in the Western world, you know, as you said, like eye contact is a way of like solidifying communication and mm-hmm. and like ensuring clear communication. And right. so maybe he's like even remarking on that, you know, of like, like how in Japan there is a breakdown of communication because people are afraid of like looking each other in the eyes. Mm -hmm. So it's crazy that someone would feel violated by eyes looking at them Mm -hmm. in the same way that they would by like someone getting stabbed or someone with like a sexual assault or something. You know what I mean? Like how they're all, if they're all in the same like playing field, like how messed up that is and how that would lead to like a breakdown of communication. Yeah. And, and yet when Sagawa looks at the camera, we get uncomfortable too. So, you know, well, that's, uh, that's true. Yeah. You know, so, they, so I mean, that set, element yeah. <laughs> is maybe still there and like somebody, you know, you're on the bus and like somebody's staring at you. We do kind of have yeah. that discomfort with eye contact too, but just not maybe true, you know, just like to a different degree or like in a different kind of, you know, yeah, maybe a, a different character to it, but you know, there is kind of that element still exists. Like, you know, imagine if we were doing this, this, uh, this podcast right now, it would just be staring at the camera this whole time. I mean, at some point, at some point, you'd be like, "Whoa, okay, this this dude is like, you know, this is too intense." <laughs> you know, there is kind of, you know, there's like levels to it. You know, I guess, right, that's I guess true. Is that's true. To say. Yeah, and I mean that just plays into the whole thing of of the ambiguity, you know, and and this is this is really something I love uh in cinema in general is like i don't want to come away from a film being like oh i know exactly what they were saying with that it's a clear defined statement we've got it we're good like you want it to like resonate with you and sort of open doors in your mind Mm -hmm. that you don't know how to necessarily close yeah yeah you know so and i think i think doing that in the context of like a sex film is just so (laughs) absurd (laughs) so i mean that's i mean that's something i've wondered too is like is like were people ever actually like getting off on watching sado films man i don't yeah i mean it for some i could see people getting off do you think um, these are people that that are um like part of like a you know like the bdsm community or that have like rape fantasies or something. Um, or... I honestly, I couldn't tell you. I don't want to mischaracterize anybody. So totally. You know, so yeah. I don't. I don't. I I couldn't tell you. But I mean, I I, I can see. You know, there's probably people with like who have like I don't know how to put this. Like maybe unusual like sexual proclivities. They would be drawn to this sure. for sure. And I mean, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, like, even though this, this stuff is like really harsh and like really brutal to watch, it is art. So it is kind of a safe way to engage with this. So, you know, I, I could yeah. definitely see people being like, oh, you know, I could, you know, I could, I could probably get yeah. off. To this. I mean, there's probably, you know, whatever it is, like there's somebody getting off to it. Like there's just no doubt in my mind. <laughs> That's <laughs> to be true. Perfectly honest. So. I mean, you could, you could like freeze a frame and be like. 
yeah, you know. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. it, I feel like we should have we should have t- um, talked about this earlier. And maybe it's uh, maybe I'm crazy, but I just feel like the way that these films are shot and executed versus like you know like American mm-hmm. or Western like softcore is completely different. You know, yeah. um, like even <laughs> yeah, though I was actually thinking about. Drawn out, but, Sorry, no, go ahead. Oh, no, it's just even though the sex scenes are drawn out, um, they still are shot in a way that it still looks like you're watching more of of like a thriller Mm. or a drama or something. They don't Mm -hmm. look like you're watching a porn where it's like a basic setup to just get people in a room and then we get a few different angles, you know? Yeah, no, he's still making the film. Like in those sex scenes, he's still making the film. Like the the grammar doesn't really change that much. And it's actually Mm. funny because there's a, there's a, pink film that i love i wrote about it actually on the uh on the newsletter on the sub stack i have it's called love hotel and, oh yeah um, i just watched that yeah um so so what well what the director will do is he'll have like a sex scene then he'll have he'll just it'll just be like one take and there'll be a sex scene and then you know they'll kind of finish and then it'll be like this post-coital kind of intimacy that is shown where they're just like hanging out and they're talking Mm -hmm. you know so so that that film really makes it clear that there's like a there's not really that big of a distinction between like the the more titillating aspects and like the drama that's going on you know he shoots everything not in the same way of course but like it's still very much coherent you know it's not like you're watching like an actual film then that just kind of splice in like a sex scene and then kind of move, you know, keep moving yeah. with the actual film. It is part of the text. Like the, the the sex scenes, they do kind of situate the whole film in this kind of, um, I don't know, register, you know, emotional, yeah. like, like sensory register. I mean, even the ASMR inducing sound design in Sado films, like that is discomfort. That's like a continuation of like the discomfort that you feel. Oh, with like okay, the other yeah. stuff right so it all, it all kind of does yeah. go here because i've seen people characterize these movies as like oh it's like you're watching an actual thriller or like a horror movie and then all of a sudden the people have sex and then kind of the you know the movie just kind of continues after that and it's like i don't i don't see it that way at all for me it's like very much one mm. thing yeah i i would agree i would agree i think that's uh definitely the case that they're they're like re- sewn into the narrative yeah. and everything yeah. And, uh, and it's not just like, oh, and now we're like showing a sex scene for no reason, you know? Right, right. And I think that's, um, <laughs> like, to be honest, like, I, I was thinking about this earlier before we start recording of how it would be interesting to do a comparison um, between like, you know, I guess like North American mm-hmm. softcore and pink yeah. films, but I really don't want to watch them. Yeah. I, just <laughs> I mean, I was, no I was interest. actually thinking about like, um, what would kind of like a kind of like a provocative, like thematically rich sexploitation film yeah. look like? And you know, I guess um, I guess I, th- I guess people would say like maybe David Cronenberg kind of gets close because there, there with is Crash. Yeah, because like I rewatched Crash. Mm. Like I mean, I watch it like all the time, <laughs> but um, I rewatched <laughs> it fairly recently, and I realized like they, you know, they're really. You know, they have sex a lot in that movie. Like, a lot of it is just them having oh, sex. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you yeah. kind of forget oh, yeah. <laughs> because, like, people talk about, like, oh, it's such a deep thing. And, I mean, it is, you know, there is depth to it. But, like, you forget that how much of it is just, like, them just being insanely horny. <laughs> yeah. You know? And, like, yeah. even, like they're, they're riding a car. And, like, I remember, like, the, the, the end scene where James Spader is, like, following his um, wife in the car. And you can see his face. It's, like he's so aroused he's so into it you know but like not mm. like not comical not like you know it's, it's not like he's having sex really but you can just see the the the, the desire the, the lust in his face somehow you know he really brings that out so you know it is also another right, film where right. it kind of just permeates the entire thing i mean it's pretty much starts with mm. the sex scene i think like two sex scenes back to back and then, like them yeah, having, yeah, you know, initiating sure. sex on the balcony. So it's like three, you know, kind of sexually charged scenes, like in a row. Yeah. No, that's. I, I mean, that is. I would say that's probably the perfect. Um, yeah. 
comparison, you know, like that would be the one kind of North American film. Other than that, um, there's films I've, I've heard about that I mm-hmm. haven't gone around to seeing yet. One of them is, um, do you know Water Power? No. Uh, so. That's the one with um, Jamie Gillis from the 70s. And um, it's about a guy who is, he becomes like a serial rapist or something. And he like, you know, uh, I think he like forces women to have enemas before raping them or something. It's, yeah. it's, it sounds incredibly harsh, but from what I've read yeah. about it, um, it's, it's done almost in the style of, of like, uh, the driller killer or, or maniac where it's like, oh. it's actually like a really good character study. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. this is from the seventies where I think Pete, there was a bit more consideration put into, um, you know, like softcore film or mm-hmm. I guess mm-hmm. hardcore as well. I'm, I'm not really yeah. sure the distinction between those two yeah. uh, back then, but, um, but, uh, yeah. So basically these films there was a lot more like care put into them. This was before I think sort of the like stereotypical um, format of a, of like a film like that being, Oh, the p- pizza delivery guys here. And <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, these were yeah, sort of yeah. like films with like a good budget, like well done, yeah, yeah. good acting, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah and Some and degree I think of what's ambition kind of went into them for sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like they wanted to make like a serious film. Um, for lack of a better word. And yeah, one right. thing that does make me um, want to see Water Power is that like the majority of people I've seen um, kind of like champion it have been mm-hmm. women. So that oh, makes okay. me feel a little bit more like, okay, you know, it's, yeah. it's uh, I don't know. It's uh, not, I, I don't know if that's like being sexist by saying that. To, in a weird <laughs> I way, know, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, it's because I, that can be the one thing that keeps me from engaging with this work is like mm-hmm. the level of misogyny at times can be kind of like, yeah, okay, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, it's just something that knowing the historical context always helps, mm-hmm. and uh, and I, I think for me, like I always, I don't usually have a problem with what a film shows more as how a film was made. And so yeah. <laughs> if, if everyone involved was like, you know, paid and treated well, like, yeah, then that's okay. You yeah. Know? Just go for it. Yeah. For sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And from what I understand, like just reading about um, Sato today, he, one of his main stars that he used frequently, I can't remember her name, but um, she, it got to a point where she was actually like, uh, you know, ha- taking part in like helping write the scripts and everything. Yeah, so she yeah. was like an integral part of like the productions of the film itself. So yeah. to me, I feel like that's like a that's like a level of like consent and respect and everything. Yeah, that is like you know, it's it's uh helps you sleep at night. Yeah, <laughs> it it does help. <laughs> I mean, I would actually be very interested in um in you know maybe somebody doing like a feminist reading of his work. That would actually be very interesting mm-hmm. because I, I kind of, when I was writing it, I just, honestly, I just kind of put that stuff aside because I was like, I'm not, you know, totally. I mean, first of all, you can't, you can never cover everything. That's like the mm-hmm. first, that's like, first of all. And second of all, I also didn't feel like I could really do that angle justice, you know, without being like reductive or like just also maybe being, you know, condescending, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, I would actually be very interested in, 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 um, in reading about that. And I have read some perspectives on it, like even on Letterboxd, you know, there's some great writers on Letterboxd and, um, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've read some like female perspectives on, on the work and it's, it's, you know, it is interesting. It did obviously influence, uh, what I was doing, but, you know, I didn't go like in for the explicit kind of reading that way. Yeah. yeah, I just I just feel like that's like a whole other article, really. Yeah. For oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For yeah. sure. <laughs> you you for could sure. just you could write pages and pages of this yeah. stuff because yeah. I think gender plays a huge part in this films, mm. um, and I think you could make the argument of some of them being, you know, feminist and some yeah. of them being misogynist and, yeah. um, and but knowingly so and intentionally so, yeah. like not not like trying to make you walk away from the film hating women or anything no, like no. that but just being just kind of throwing of like that stuff movie. at you kind of confronting you with it yeah yeah like this is an ugly film and that's an yeah. ugly thing you know yeah i mean there's a 
um, his movie. I think this is probably his. I would say this is probably his grimmest like <laughs> film ever. Uh, Lolita Vibrator Torture. It? Yeah, I, knew I would say <laughs> that's probably like in terms of like just like, the discomfort I felt watching it. That's probably the worst one, honestly. Like even worse than like Splatter Naked Blood. Um, well, yeah, which is just gross, was... but like you know, yeah, Lolita is kind of like. Oh man, you know, it's like oh, some of some of the stuff yeah. I remember. I mean, you probably know the, which scene I'm talking about. I don't want to spoil it necessarily, but like where he, like somebody gets killed and like he puts the body in the tub and then he does something with it. <laughs> I mean, okay, hmm. I, I might have I to say, I remember it, like, that. yeah, no, he actually urinates on the body like after killing it. Oh geez. Yeah. So okay, I, I remember watching that and like. It, you know, like, you know, he's torture, like he's sexually abusing them and he's like, he's torturing them and like he murders this, this girl. And then, you know, he stuffs her body in like this tub thing. And, you know, this is like, all, you know, you've seen a bunch of his movies and you're almost like, it almost doesn't even affect you anymore. And then it's like, and then he right, does yeah. almost, almost, I mean, it is still pretty rough to watch. And, and then he does that yeah. and you're like, Oh my God. You know, I remember just seeing it and just throwing my hands up being like, Oh no geez you know <laughs> so you know he does kind of go uh, to like really extreme places and you know like how do you even meaningfully like say this is like sexist or not sexist you know it's like almost like this it's almost like these yeah. these uh these terms don't even really make sense with what you're seeing yeah like it, it can't be just sexist but it can't be like not sexist even you know it's like right, it's kind of both right. you know because it is mm. kind of it is kind of provocative also in the way that like the, the female main character she kind of the way she collaborates like with her with the kidnapper and like the guy who abuses her and stuff and like she collaborates with him almost like mm -hmm. they become like almost partners in crime but like the dynamic is so off you think oh there's more going on and then you know surprise there is more going on and it kind of becomes almost like a it becomes you know I don't want to say empowering but it's very subversive. You know, it's very subversive the way he kind yeah. of handles that dynamic. So, you know, sometimes I feel like yeah. these terms are, are almost like insufficient to really capture what what it is he's doing and what it is like that people are probably getting out of it, too. Well, I, I think you uh, hit the nail on the head when you said that, um, like trying to in, uh, speak on the the like sexist quality of it would be reductive. Yeah, because it you're, could be. You're it could it could be, but it, it's, yeah. it's, again, it's this whole idea of, um, of like the ambiguity of Sado is like, right. once you land on something, you're kind of almost dismissing so many other aspects of it, Yeah, yeah. you know? And, um, and I do agree that the ending is weirdly empowering. And it was something yeah. that made me feel a little bit more comfortable with what I had just watched. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. In a very weird way. So. Very, very much so. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, yeah, there's um, there's uh, like one of the first um early pink films I watched was uh Koji Wakamatsu's, um, oh, it's like the embryo, uh, I forget oh. it's like the embryo hunt in secret or something. Yeah, yeah, I know which one you mean. I and haven't seen that one, but I, yeah, it's it's great, and I don't know, like, so basically it is like a man, like torturing this woman, and then, but, uh, you know, spoiler alert, like she has her come up and set the end. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, it made me feel obviously more comfortable with watching it, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like, Oh, okay. And, and I think that is sort of like plays into the ambiguity of, I mm -hmm. mean, maybe of this genre as a whole of just like, it's never allowing you to say, is this, you know, a sadistic or misogynistic film Mm -hmm. or is this like empowering in any way you know like yeah. you can't really like rest on any like sole definition of it yeah. and um i think sato's work really like like um brings that to a whole new level and incorporates like technology and communication into yeah. that yeah yeah for sure for sure I mean, it's almost like it's almost like being able to call it like this definite thing would be too comfortable, almost. Like he would make it too easy for you. Like that's part of the discomfort. Yeah. Like you can't comfortably land, comfortably land on saying, "Oh, this is you know this or that." It's constantly like 
it's constantly two right. things or three things or you know however many things right right yeah because that would be that would that yeah. would make it to you know i mean it's it's but it's the same thing with like if you this might be kind of a weird comparison but like you watch like a at least the good ones like you watch like a religious film or a film about like maybe faith oh. or something you know like you you watch something like bad lieutenant hmm. That movie is very, you know, it's, it's about, you know, about Catholic guilt and like sin and like redemption and all these things. But like, it is about all these things. And like, there is an arc for the lieutenant. But like, it, it's not like the film is mm-hmm. saying, oh, he was a bad person and now he found faith. And now he's a good person. Right. You know, it's like not even like that kind of film. I mean, I mean, maybe that's not a typical religious film. You know, because it is kind of, it has kind of an exploitation no, kind no. of vibe to it. But, you know, just in terms oh, of, totally. like, theme, you know, people wouldn't necessarily think that, like, you know, that's a common criticism of, like, religion. Like, oh, it makes it so easy, you know. It's like, you can just say five Hail Marys and everything's good. But, like, that a movie like that shows how right. just, like, difficult these things really are. Because, like, the lieutenant, mm-hmm. like, he, you know, what I found interesting with that movie, for instance, is, like, he does kind of, sexually harass not kind of he does like actually sexually harass like two young oh, yeah. women but then he's like enraged yeah. about these two two kids that like sexually assaulted someone but it's like how much better are you really you know who are you right. really to to even judge them and i think you know he never says that in a movie he doesn't actively realize this but i think he does kind of get his head in into that space where he kind of does realize like oh man i've you know I'm actually not that much better than these people are. And that, that like, kind of starts like something resembling a redemption. Right. But like, there's no yeah. easy answers because like, how do you, what are you, so, you know, like in the real world, if there was like a person like that, what would you do with them? There's no real like easy answer. Yeah. To I mean, um, not really. it, it kind of makes me think uh, that this idea, I mean, if, if you do believe in good and evil or mm-hmm. how, how would I put this? Like, like basically good and evil existing in like a binary mm-hmm. in a way that, mm-hmm. um, and basically like Abel Ferrer is trying to say that like, there is no binary to it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like there mm-hmm. is no like completely good, completely evil. It's not like yeah. a switch you can turn on and off. Right, right. With that being said though, with religion, it does no matter what give you an arc. You know, it's like objectively you can see an arc. And so whatever he's doing, if it's going from bad to good, he is transforming and he's changing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that is sort of like, I'm, I'm an atheist. um, Mm -hmm. And so that, but that's how I've always looked at religion in, in maybe a good way, um, Mm -hmm. which sounds confusing how I'm mixing all these away. uh, You're good. You're good. (laughs) Is that it does provide people. Okay. It provides people with an arc. Of like, yeah. I am in one spot and I need to get to another. And that's yeah. how religion can be a good thing often. For, like if you're someone who's like struggling with addiction or whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah. you're yeah. in a bad place that you need to pull yourself out of. Religion mm-hmm. can can give you an arc. And so mm-hmm. I think um, with Bad Lieutenant, it's like Abel Ferreira was kind of giving us that of like, it's an arc. It doesn't mean that you're going from bad to good because objectively we can all see that those don't exist. Like mm-hmm. that there is no binary of like good and evil. Do you know what yeah. I mean? I don't know. I know, it's like, yeah, I know like what you mean. You. Yeah. But um, okay. uh, <laughs> it's actually, it reminds me also of there's a Dostoevsky quote too, where it's like, I don't rem- remember exactly, but he's uh, a character says this in the brothers Karamazov. And uh, he says okay. something, something to the effect of like, you know, if you, if you want to call, you know, if you want to call someone else, like a, a sinner or, or a criminal or whatever you need to first recognize that you yourself are that too you know that kind mm, of this this good and evil okay. is in everybody you know like you you're you're you know you're pointing the finger but like you you know you know you're a person too you're not perfect either you you are in that you know you've done yeah. things wrong as well you know so there the, that yeah, binary doesn't really you know it, it, it can't really because we're in my view at least we're all kind of you know obviously i mean i'm not saying everybody's like you know hitler and is just like a normal person like anybody could be him like that's well, not you know obviously yeah. that's not that extreme <laughs> maybe but but right. you know at, at the end of the day he did kind of you know 
people can tap into things that are, you know, that we carry in ourselves and like bring bad mm. stuff, bring bad stuff out. That's just a reality. Yeah. It's just like a, that's just how it is. And, and, you know, people have defended horrible things and have co- committed, like, you know, participated in horrible things in the name of, you know, whatever religion, politics and whatever. So that is part of who we are. So mm. I think these binaries, especially mm. when we're talking about art, they just, I don't, th- I don't, I don't think it's useful really. It's like, Oh, this character is a bad person. No. And it's like, no, I mean, is he like is like is like Travis Bickle? Is he a bad person? He's dangerous, sure. Yeah. But like, is yeah. he a bad person? You can't really answer that, and that's not what the movie is about, anyway. Yeah, I think. Well, I, what I love about Taxi Driver is that it, it does put you in that uncomfortable position where you're like, I hate to say it, but it's making you in, enjoy the presence of a bad person, mm-hmm. something, someone that in in our reality. Um, we would completely reject, you know? Yeah. And to some degree, yeah. I think you you still need to reject him, but his actions eventually bring, at least in terms of the narrative, some sort of, of um, resolution and some sort of yeah. justice, you know? But even yeah. then, and it, but even in those terms, like the justice that happens is is subjective, you know? Like, yeah. is it right to kill people? It's all these And, and also it's incidental, um, I think, you know, to be fair, Mm. I also think it's incidental. Like, I think, um, I think a lot of what happens in that movie is, is just like him lashing out and just like, he happens to hit the right target. So everybody celebrates him at the end. Like, oh, what a hero, you know? Mm. But like, but like, you know, you can see it at the end. He looks in his rear view mirror and he's like, oh, what's that? And, you know, then like, who knows what that's going to be? You know, because like a couple of scenes earlier was trying to like kill a politician assassinate like right. a, a, can- a political candidate so so you know it's all kind of like you know i mean you you said rightly we would re- we would reject him in in real life but would we though i mean you know like we wouldn't know him like that maybe if you read you know somewhere like oh somebody killed like a couple of johns and like a pimp who was like pimping out like a 12 year old girl we wouldn't feel bad about you know we would we would even say yeah he's a hero or whatever Right, but like just because we don't know, like that same person yeah. might have lashed out at like a completely different target. Right, right. So, well, then, yeah, then it's, it's yeah. well, it's it's um, and I think maybe this would be a good bridge from what we're talking about to Sato, but um, it's this whole idea of like communication um has to be like a solid, tangible thing. You can't just have am- ambiguity. Um, how am I, okay, how am I trying to say this? Like, <laughs> once you say something and you and you put it down, you are making like a defined statement. You're making a definitive statement. Um, in order to communicate with people, like you have to say, like, this is how I feel, and these are my actions, and et cetera, et cetera. Like, mm-hmm. it's not like we're speaking in, mm-hmm. in like poetic, um, you know, uh, expressions right. where we can have our emotions kind of dictate things and like live in the ambiguity. Right. So in terms of mm-hmm. like, I know this is probably really confusing, but um, in terms mm-hmm. of like Travis Bickle, then what you're saying is like, if, if we weren't going to reject him, it's because we've been told a story about him that is giving us like only the facts of like his actions at the very end of the film, right? Right, right. And right. so, but it, the whole entire story is something more ambiguous, you know? Right, right. And so I think um, for communication to exist, it does need to be solidified, right? Yeah. It needs to have like something definitive. It can't, it can't exist. Uh, it can't really like thrive in ambiguity. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. Okay, I think I know so what you're getting it, at. Yeah. Yeah, and so in terms of of like Sato's work, because his films speak a lot to communication and the breakdown of communication, mm-hmm. um, the breakdown of communication is also the existence of all these different possibilities, you know, mm-hmm. and all these different shades of morality and mm-hmm. sh- and and different like types of actions. So in a way, like like you know, the Sato film in comparison to Taxi Driver, would be like getting the entire story, all mm-hmm. the bad things, you know, the good mm-hmm. and the bad. Mm-hmm. Whereas like the the communication that is solidified would possibly be the story 
that is only the bad actions or the good actions mm-hmm. from a Sato film. Mm-hmm. I feel like I might have to edit this out. Like yeah. this is such a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is. It is kind of interesting because I. Yeah, I mean, I feel like what makes what makes um, Sato's film so so um, so interesting and like alluring and like and some to some degree even addictive even to me at least like yeah. you know sometimes i really like i feel like i'm almost addicted to those like vibes i don't know is that it kind of it kind of doesn't it doesn't ever take you out of out of like those dark kind of things like that that is the you know because like even even in like you know we were talking we were talking about we we're talking about taxi driver it's like he mm-hmm. goes on like a you know He's, he seems like a nice person at first and it kind of devolves and, you know, it gets worse. But like Sato films is like, you're in it. And like, that's it. You know, it's almost like a, it's almost like a power violence song or something. Like there's no intro, okay. there's no fancy, like nothing, you know, it's like, just yeah. like, you know, count in and just like blast, you know, like even in terms just, of like, length, like a wall, yeah. Yeah. Right. Even in terms oh, of yeah, length, never... It's like an hour, you know? Well, I was going to say that like, that's, um, I think that's a common, thing that people say about why they are addictive is because they're usually like an hour 70 Mm. minutes tops and so when you start to get curious about them you're like well i do have an hour free you know right right, right. Right. so you just want to like barrel through them i also think too like last night was the first time i watched two back to back Mm -hmm. and that that really like highlighted the fact that you know the more you watch of his films the more Mm -hmm. you start to like unpack Mm -hmm. what's going on you start Mm -hmm. to see the recurring themes Mm -hmm. and you almost you just get more out of them you know yeah like you start to pick you start to understand the language of sato yeah yeah i mean he has like every kind of filmmaker with like a signature style like any auteur he has like his own kind of grammar going on like you you know sometimes it's you know like there is a specific quality and like not everybody will get into it right away not everybody would will get into it ever you know some people will just like it's not for me but you know once you're hooked it's like you know it's hard to shake like it's you know i I found myself like after i did like after i watched like a bunch of his films back to back i I caught myself when i was like writing i was writing some review uh that like of a movie that had like nothing to do with sato like and I just like caught myself like trying to make reference, like trying to kind of get a reference in there, because I was like, I need to spread oh. the word, you know. <laughs> and I just kind of—it's really like an infects your brain almost, which is also something that kind of mm. that kind of his his um, his films tend to do. I mean, a lot of a lot of Japanese movies do have that thing. Even like the horror movies, they have this thing about like you know like like the horror kind of infecting or spreading like a virus or like a computer virus, you know, like a movie like Pulse. Incidentally, Kiyoshi mm. Kurosawa actually got his start in pink films too. So that's, that's an interesting connection. Right. right there. What, yeah. do you know which ones he did? I don't remember the titles, or? no, but they're fairly obscure, oh. you know, typical pink film titles, like nothing. Okay. But yeah, I don't know. I, I, I didn't I've seek seen... them out, honestly. Yeah, I guess because, I mean, if he only did like one or two or something, then yeah, he was an assistant director on a bunch of them. Be. But he, he, I okay. think he directed himself. Like as a director, he did like two or three or something. No, nothing crazy. Like, but like, he was okay. an assistant director. On a yeah. Bunch of them. Right, right, right. Yeah, because it was sort of um, it was like a good place for filmmakers mm-hmm. to get their start. And everything yeah. and so, they wouldn't tell you what to yeah. do like they would you could just like you know like you know as long as you have like carte a certain blanche. amount of sex scenes like yeah carte blanche like you can just like yeah um you can just do what you can just do what you want essentially do you do you know like what the specifics were or do you think it probably changed every production like how many sex scenes or i think it might have been even like every five or ten minutes or something they need yeah I'm, I'm actually not there. sure i was i was trying to get like a real good grip on it when i was researching but like there i don't 
I'm not exactly sure. Mm-hmm. And like some some films, you know, I wasn't I wasn't going to sit there with like a t- with like a stopwatch, and like you know, actually, <laughs> you know, so I was, I was make, it, just, make it into a drinking game or yeah. something. <laughs> I mean, you'd be dead. Like it's all <laughs> you'd be dead ah! at some point. But yeah, no, well, it's um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know exactly, but like, I guess it var- There was some slight variation, probably, but yeah, I don't know. Depends probably on the production mm-hmm. company too. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, so th- this time, guys, we'll give you a bit more if you have yeah. three more, yeah. that kind of thing, yeah. 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 Because I think they approached, I think the production company would actually approach the filmmakers with, like, a like a rough concept, kind of, but very oh, really? rough. I th- yeah, I think, or uh, sometimes they would, at least. I think Sato mentioned it in, um, in this uh, panel that he was a part of, uh, that the production company for uh, wanted, like, the gave him like a like a pitch like an like an elevator pitch for like uh the, the movie celluloid nightmares and um and he kind of changed okay. it into his own thing kind of but yeah, yeah the basic idea they kind of gave him but like it, you know you wouldn't like you could have made a totally different movie with what they gave him i don't remember exactly what they said but it could have been a totally yeah, different yeah. movie so he really you know it is him it is him making this film it is him twisting this idea until it becomes like this weird you know whatever <laughs> whatever it is you know? yeah um he made uh i think he made like a few non-pink films um i was just reading about that because um around the time that he did splatter naked blood mm-hmm. there's i think two or three other films he made that were like pretty sleazy and and messed up but they aren't technically pink films oh, I, okay. I think one's nights uh night of bodies model or something mm-hmm. is one of them yeah um i haven't seen any of those but i, I want to no. seek them out but i'm, I'm yeah, curious I about should. them yeah i mean honestly i have to i have to come clean here i there's a lot of stuff i haven't seen like you know i almost felt like i was writing it and then like looking at how it was presented, it was almost like, oh, this is like the definitive guide to like, you know. <laughs> no, no. But like, but like really, impossible. it was really, I mean, first of all, it's impossible. And second of all, it's really just me being into these movies and like wanting mm-hmm. a reason to seek them out and like, you know, kind of get people into it, hopefully. And, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's really well, all was, it is. I was, I was um... Because I, I really love the article, honestly, and I, yeah, I really thanks, hope more thanks. people read it based on this. Well, I mean, read it in general, but I hope people check it out after they watch this episode. Um, but it, it made me think, and I was saying this to Fred before we started recording, of the um, Jean Relen documentary that came out earlier this year that I believe Kat Ellinger did. Uh, I can't remember who she directed it with. But um, basically, and like I've, I've mentioned this in my reviews of, of Sato's stuff, like how Jean Relen would be a good director to compare him to because, um, you know, he did have like a certain level of sleaze and transgressive mm-hmm. content to his films, but he also had a lot of recurring themes. And the more you watch of his films, you'll start to see these sim- similar things pop up that sort of bring out like an emotional core that I think would be easy to dismiss if you were just engaging with like the first genre land film you'd ever seen. Um, but yeah, so this documentary that came out really highlighted a lot of the intellectual qualities to his films and sort of giving you like a basic thematic guide to understanding like what it makes him special. And I think mm-hmm. that's what I loved about your article was that like, it's, it's not super long. I think it's like 10 pages or something or six pages. I think or... it's like just, just over 4,000 words. I think it's like, a, okay. it's like, a, uh, I don't know, like a 15 minute read probably. Yeah, it's it, but it's it feels like just right. Where mm. is whereas if like I had never heard of any of this before, I know I'd be writing down the titles and like, mm. okay, let's go check this out. You know, yeah. especially since you do a really good job of selling, you you sell a, a quite a lot of them as like as like really interesting horror films. Yeah. Oh, th- do I? Because I <laughs> yeah. I don't necessarily th- <laughs> that wasn't necessarily the intention or anything. You know, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, like as horror. Well, films, maybe that's just. That's just you. That's just your gore hound like brain. Like, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Split your head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, do you think we'll ever get like a, like a box set or even just like a couple of Blu-rays of his films at some point? Oh man. I mean, I, I, I would sure hope so because like, um, 
they are hard to get and like decent quality and like i think the films mm-hmm. do deserve it with with some curation of course because like not every not every yeah. i mean most of what i've seen i thought was really good um yeah like, really good up until like genuinely like actually like five star stuff but um mm-hmm. you know i mean i like what comes to mind is like in a in a thicket I just, I mean, I just. Oh, I haven't was, seen that one. Yeah, I mean, I just thought that was really kind of. It's it's actually an adaptation of this um of this short story called In a Grove that Rashomon was based on. Cool. And um, you know, and he kind of, you know, he does this Sado thing with it, where it's like, uh, you know, he kind of he kind of de-emphasizes those. Um, actually, that's actually an error in the article. I say that he kind of keeps ah. the supernatural stuff from the story in. But it's like mm-hmm. the supernatural stuff isn't in the story. I've actually emailed the editor about it already, oh, so he's okay. gonna he's gonna correct it. I don't know what I was thinking. Okay. You know, I was I was nearing the end, so my brain was just like gone. You know, it was just fried. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no. But he kind of he kind of he kind of uh, gets all this like supernatural, like folkloric kind of stuff in there, which like on paper is interesting. Oh. But like if you watch it, it's just kind of I don't know. It just doesn't really have any like. It doesn't have any like sauce to it. Like it feels kind of, it feels kind of meager, kind of, you know, kind of mm. slight. So I would, you know, so sometimes he doesn't really hit. And there's some like really bizarre CGI in there even. Like I was shocked to see like CGI oh. in a Sato film. But like the presentation of it is, it's, it's almost like you're getting like a respectable kind of version of his movie, which was like interesting because like even his like, all of his stuff I've seen like has some sort of like weird intro that's already really titillating or like it has like industrial music playing and like, you know, really puts yeah. you in there. And like that movie is just like a shot of like, so, like a, some body of water, like still water. And like his name comes up and I was like, Oh, what, you know, what are we, <laughs> like, what are we doing here? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, th- that one didn't land exactly, but like, I think with some curation and like, um, you know, maybe some, you know, some, maybe uh, some writing to kind of help you make sense of what's going on, especially for newcomers. I think that would, it would be a good, cool thing for sure. But I have to be honest though, I'm not really yeah. a person, you know, like even, even you, I see on your Instagram every once in a while, you're like, uh, oh wow, the, you know, Arrow video is bringing out this new thing and whatever. I'm not, personally, I don't really follow that stuff at all, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, not a, you know. You're not a collector? Of course, you know. <laughs> not really <laughs> not really no i'm just i just oh, okay, honestly okay. honestly what i do what i do is like if it's um if like you know if it's like a li- living filmmaker or like a living author or whatever then i'll you know give the money mm-hmm. and i like, try to support them as good as as best i can but like for you know, uh, okay but like for old stuff i'm really not that sentimental honestly it's just like i'm okay it's not I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'll, not, I'll not buy a Blu-ray, everyone. I'll buy like a box set, you know, but I'm just not really a collector in that way. Yeah. I'm very much yeah. about like, where can I get it? How can I watch it? And, you know, like, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just want to, you want to engage with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm more, yeah, yeah. That's I'm just it, like, yeah. I'm, you know. But like I said, I mean, I do, I do, I do still, I'm just not a collector, you know. But like if a Sado box, but yeah. like if a Sado box that came out, like oh, hell yeah, I'd be like first in line <laughs> for sure. Well, because because like I think the thing that I get excited about with a lot of these like um, restorations and stuff is like seeing the film mm. presented it as beautiful as possible. Yeah. And um, with his films, they're so hard to find, and yeah, they yeah. look like trash half the time when you yeah, find yeah. them. So to see them pristine and beautiful would yeah. be like wild <laughs> yeah it would, be, it, would be, it would be jarring probably it would be like weird but um yeah yeah I mean, for sure but I, I think i think it's actually funny um because like you know these movies were in or a lot of them they were in theaters they were kind of projected on mm. like a big screen and like to see them now is it's funny how the quality or just like the the way you see them now has kind of changed it's almost like it has like a very kind of you know, like walking into a theater, like paying somebody money and like sitting down and watching this is like has such a different like aura to it than like finding a file on some like weird 
website you yeah. know <laughs> that's like in russian <laughs> And like, and, yeah. <laughs> and you see all these scan lines and everything, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting how that kind of, for me, that kind of really adds to the whole thing, you know, that's become for me, like right. part of, part of the experience, part of, um, you know, part of how I see his work, like that obscurity is like almost like part of the text now, because it d- does feel like right. it's something you're not supposed to be watching. Because if you were supposed to watch it, you could just stream it on Netflix or whatever. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, you know. So, so kind of that does add to the mystery of it. But you know, I mean, he's still a human being, and he, you know, he deserves to be like acknowledged for his work. So you know, I wouldn't be opposed to like a, to like you know, getting a more proper kind of release for his stuff. But yeah, yeah, I think I think the Penku genre as a whole has that quality of uh, for me like you might say like oh it feels like something you shouldn't watch and for me it's always like who is this for do you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah, yeah like who are they so who did they make this for like what is i have people just yeah. watch it out of morbid curiosity yeah um yeah <laughs> but i do think that sado sado as we've been talking about it at such such a great length is like he really stands above a lot of the other directors yeah, and I'd say so. he does have that Cronenbergian quality to him. Yeah. And so I think um, a box set or, or even just a few Blu-rays or something mm. to put him out there would be, would be really great to be like, okay, I know the whole genre is really hard to engage with, but yeah. he, he's worth taking the time. And I also think it would be like an interesting thing because like there is a lot of discussion um about like sex scenes in movies and stuff and i think and i think his yeah his movies do kind of show the you know sometimes i'm hesitant to argue this way because like a scene doesn't mm. need to justify its existence really in my view it just needs to be good mm. or like interesting yeah but like i think i think it is still though i do think it is kind of um it does kind of show how integral that aspect can be to the to the film as a whole you know so Mm -hmm. so you know i think it would also be interesting to kind of contribute to that discussion too because like some of the stuff i i hear i'm just like like you know who cares if the scene doesn't add to the plot you know that's not yeah like that's just never something i worry about like i like it or i don't like it or i think it's like it does something for me or it doesn't well at that point, it becomes this whole thing of like, well, what is the plot? And are you <laughs> right. worried about the plot? Are you yeah. worried about the plot in the sense of like, um, what can be encapsulated in a synopsis? Right. Or are you worried about the story? And right. to me, people tend to like, not think about how, you know, a story is an experience. It's all the emotions. It's yeah. all the suspense and everything, mm-hmm. you know, the mm-hmm. whole journey, mm-hmm. the whole roller coaster ride of it. Yeah. And people really don't take that in. You, you used this word when we were talking uh, like a while back. Um, I think it's like guess, uh, months ago work. I'm sorry? It's like a German word. It's like. Guess oh, guess um, guess yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. when you said that, that was like. Phew, I love that. That's because yeah. I, I looked it up and it's, it's like you, you were, cause you were saying you stopped regarding films as like individual by their individual elements and more of just like an entire like tapestry of all these elements. Right. Mm-hmm. And did so did I, I think, say that? Um, no, I, I oh. know, not verbatim, but, oh, oh, okay. but like you said, you said something along those lines. Oh, cause um, I was like, man, and, I'm smart. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I try to remember. You said something like that, and, and I yeah. was like, I love that because, yeah. like, I, I might have even said this in our conversation, but like, I really love the idea of of looking at art as like spinning plates. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Every, so every element is now moving together, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so to me, if if you were to just disregard all those things and start looking at it as like, well, this scene, what does it add to the plot? Mm-hmm. Is like you're clearly not looking at the gesamtskur yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean i was kind of playing fast and loose with that term i think gesamtkunstwerk also refers more to like maybe maybe like the you know an artist's entire body of work so if they're a musician and oh, an art okay. and a painter and like a and like um a filmmaker you know you would look at like the whole thing as like one whole 
body of work. Oh, you know? okay. I, I was I was more kind of using it in like you know, in like a just like kind of to to kind of define it better. You know, like you, the, you know, the, <laughs> a movie kind of a lot of stuff comes together like sound design, acting, writing. You know, right. the, the the photography, and in that way, it's kind of like a a, a, a mini gesamtkunstwerk. You know, that's more right. what I meant. That's, you know, so okay. That's what so I was these focusing things, on. So these things yeah. come together and it's like, you know, that makes one whole thing. It's not like, oh man, I love the movie. I was like, I was in tears, but man, the editing was terrible. Like, you know, it just seems right, weird right. to me to say, you know, to say that, but I just, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't usually, um, I think everything kind of is, or at least is supposed to work together for like a common goal. And, you know, you can't, you can't have like, you know, you can't have like a super sleazy lo-fi, like punk filmmaking thing going on, but then you have like mm. all these like beautiful Hollywood LA people that are yeah. just like mugging for the, ca- you know, like at some point, like, you know, these things mm. need to kind of work together. I mean, you could maybe yeah. use that in like a subversive way, but like, you know, just, you know what I mean though? It's like, it needs to kind of, totally. it needs to, these things need to work together in like a way that makes, makes sense or like adds to what it is you're trying to do. So yeah, everything complements each other. Exactly. Exactly. And it's all, it's all, it's all like creating like one flowing yeah. story, one flowing yeah. experience, you know? Yeah. And it is like a sensory experience too, because like people overemphasize, overemphasize plot very, very often, but like, it is also, mm-hmm. you know, like, like these Sato sex scenes, like it's, you're sitting there and you're hearing this, this like slurping sound. That's like part of the experience, you know, that's part of it. That's totally, like, you know, you're, you're having an experience. You're not thinking like, Oh my God, you know, like, you know, how's the plot going to advance from here? Like, no, this is this yeah. is part of what's going on. You know, the plot is just like, basically it's just an excuse to get people to go to, to uh, do like interesting shit. That's essentially what it is. Yeah. You know, I like, like getting yeah, someone somewhere is... like, you know, <laughs> Mm. These people need the to be in the room together. How can we the get story? Them? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this is great. This is good. Yeah. Um, well, we've been talking for, I mean, I'll probably edit this down, but it's uh, yeah. like, we're about like one forty two. So oh, yeah, I man. feel like we should, uh, we should wrap things up, but uh, All right. Fred, thank you so much for coming on. That was awesome. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for having yeah, me. It was, would you, it was fun. Would you yeah. be, yeah, would you be down to come on again sometime soon? Like maybe we can yeah. uh, dissect something else. Okay, cool, yeah, cool. For sure, for sure. Yeah, Just so, let me know. Uh, Just hit me up. Yeah, totally. This is great. Um, do you have any parting thoughts or things you want to plug? Well, I mean, um, I'm not much of a marketing person. <laughs> All I know how to do is like post my stuff online and just hope that people see yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I know how to do. But I mean, you know, yeah. you can uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, at Fred, like bottom dash. What's the, what's the word? I, I'll I'll um I'll put the links in. So I'll okay, put a yeah, link in you, for you can just you your, can just link me your Twitter. In. Yeah, I have like you know I, um, I post all my stuff on there. Cool. So uh, and, and then, you can uh, sign up for the Substack. Substack. Yeah, for sure. Cool. If you want, I started and, doing fiction uh, actually yesterday. I released my first piece of oh, fiction shit. on there. So I'm branching oh, out. Cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying to. Okay, cool. Is um is the Substack is it like a paid subscription? No, you can pay. You have that option, but you can okay. also just like you can also just do um do like a free free thing. It doesn't matter. You know, I used to do like um I started out and I did like um like paid subscriber only articles. Mm-hmm. Just like, you know, occasionally but like I honestly, yeah. I just stopped doing that because I thought like, who who cares? Like you know, just read. Just <laughs> I just want people to read the stuff. Right. That's that's what I yeah. want really. So you know, you yeah, can sign totally up. You do. don't have to pay anything, and you'll hopefully get some stuff in there you like. Cool. Yeah, I, I definitely got to get on that. So yeah. All right. But uh, thank you so much, Fred. And thank you. Have yourself a wonderful day. Yeah, yes, we'll you be too. in touch. All right. All right. All right. Have a good one, man. You too.